I want to thank you all on behalf of the Chamber, and as important or more important, uh, the FGFA, who really has been over the years uh, an excellent sponsor, in many ways reflects uh, for us a very valuable uh, resource because the Chamber is all about creating greater understanding between Brazil and the United States, uh, which in turn creates, creates greater flows, uh, uh, trade, investment, etc. And so, uh, an FGJ is uh, nobody better at, at explaining, and again, uh, helping us to provide great content. Uh, this event is one of those, and I think I'm going to leave that with a very short introduction. I'm going to now allow uh, Paulo uh, Vieira, who's always been uh, for us uh, as the director of the chamber, uh, probably as knowledgeable an economist as one will find about Brazil, despite all his years in the United States. And uh, I'll let him uh, explain it and moderate the event. Thank you, Paulo. Thank you, Ted. Uh, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a, a particular honor to be able to welcome uh, Professor uh, Carlos Ivan Simon Silvel. Uh, I wonder, I mean, so many of you here are from Fundação de Cudo Vargas, but for those of you who are not, I wonder if you have a, a good sense of how important the job that uh, Professor Simonsen has. I mean, let me just give you a very brief sense. I mean, most of us who are economists here in the United States, we know the uh, National Bureau of Economic Research, the NBER. We also know the Social Sciences Research Council. Well, the Fundação Getúlio Vargas is bigger than these two things combined. Um, it, um, it's, um, for, for those of us have, that have analyzed the Brazilian economy over the years, it is the uh, first, um, and still today, one of the major providers of inflation indices. Uh, these are the, the ones that, if you want to do any uh, historical analysis, I see Professor Fischler here, you know, you have to go back and use the Fundação de Uruguaga indices, because that was before uh, the Census Bureau began to calculate uh, inflation. Um, it also is a major provider of uh, consumer and businesses surveys, and uh, these are widely used uh, for all of us that, that follow the economy. It was the first uh, center of postgraduate uh, studies in economics, <coughs> and uh, still today is uh, one of the top-ranked uh, schools in the world. Um, it offers not only one, but two PhD programs in economics, one in, Sao, in Rio de Janeiro at the PGA and one in Sao Paulo. Um, it uh, also has the first center of public administration in Brazil, in the Graduate School of Public Administration, and then it has branched out <coughs> into other areas of the social sciences, uh, including law, and sociology, and so on. Um, and it is a major academic publisher, and it produces uh, very important journals, including the Brazilian uh, Journal of Economics, which is the oldest uh, economics and the most distinguished economics publication in Brazil. And uh, uh, last but not least, as many of you know, it is a center of specialized consulting for the public and private sector uh, in Brazil. So. Uh, all of this is under the guidance and directorship of uh, Professor Simonsik, so it's really a great pleasure uh, and an honor to, to have him here with us. Please, Professor Simonsik. Well, the first rule for a president of FGV is to be discreet, <laughs> especially when I am in Brazil. I have to follow that rule. But I'm not in Brazil, so <laughs> I agreed to give this lecture. And uh, as you will see, I'm very unconventional. Let me start by remembering uh, the seminar that I attended in 1981, when Rudiger Dornbusch and my uncle, Maria Vicky Simonsen, who had been Minister of Finance of Brazil, organized in Rio. And Franco Modigliani, uh, Edmund Phelps, uh, Thomas Sargent, Bob Lucas, 
all of them Nobel Prizes, not all of them Nobel Prizes at that time, were present. And they started discussing uh, Brazilian problems and how monetary policy should be conducted, and the mistakes in conducting monetary policy. <coughs> After a while, after a brilliant exposition <coughs> by Professor Sargent, uh, my uncle turned to him and said, Tom, do you have any idea that we don't have a term structure of interest rates in Brazil? <laughs> Sargent looked at him and said, then everything that I have said is not good for you. <laughs> okay, this is the first point. <laughs> Don't take for granted that the valid underlying assumptions for the US are true for Brazil. Be you either American or Brazilian. Brazil in Brazil, we have more than a hundred years ago committed a huge mistake. Someone that entitled himself the Eagle of Aya, <laughs> self-entitled Eagle, uh, copied American federalism into our 1891 Constitution. He copied the federalism of a country where the nation had created the state, while Brazil is a country where the state was creating the nation. Quite different. We still have problems because of that, and people don't realize. It is more than a hundred and uh, twenty something years, and we don't realize that we still have problems because of that. So, don't take for granted that underlying assumptions here in America or in Europe are the same as in Brazil. What do we have in Brazil? You have a huge governance problem. Very long to fix, very difficult, very complicated, for which, it is my opinion, people don't have many clues. What are we really discussing? What are the roots of our problems? Is that income distribution? Is that the size of a deficit? Is that the use of public money? Is that corruption? What is it? All of these problems separate things. How do they interact? <coughs> or are they coming from a single source? Well, let me try to simplify and tell you the following. Uh, I believe, I firmly believe, that one of the roots of our problems is that, first of all, we don't understand the entangling of budgetary issues, federalism, and political reform. They are all three sides of a, our problem, our governance problem. So I will fix my attention to the effects of having a very bad budgetary process. By budgetary process, I understand that collection of actions that start when someone in the governmental department decides for a public policy proposal, writes it down, <coughs> makes a budget for it, sends it to Congress, sends it to the government, uh, to the executive, the executive console accepts that, consolidates it, and then send it, sends it to Congress for discussion. Afterwards, after it has been voted and interacted between the executive and the legislative power, you have a budget. In Brazil, we should have something called Lei de Diretrizes Orçamentárias, LDO. In Brazil, we look at the number. 
We don't look at the policy. The business plan is ignored. So, first underlying assumption that is different. In America, you look at the business plan. In Brazil, we look at the number. Second underlying assumption. What is agreed upon will be followed, will be executed, unless there is such a disaster that the thing will have to come back to Congress. In Brazil, no. We call we have something called DRU, which is basic which basically says, well, this thing that has been approved is just an authorization. It's not mandatory. The practical effect of that is that the strategy of a country stays only at the hands of the executive power. He may propose any budget. Congress may modify it at the end because of contingency. He may do whatever he wants. And no one discusses if the budget, <coughs> the plan behind the budget, matters or not, if it's being executed or not. And this, of course, introduces a lot of uncertainty, of unpredictability. What is a king thinking? Sometimes a king is not thinking about anything. Okay. He's just reacting. And that makes everything very unpredictable. It yields, as a consequence, an extremely competitive environment for governmental resources that provokes, amongst other things, the division of parties. Clearly, there is a gain in our budgetary process that uh, mimics the gain for evangelical churches. I hope no one here is evangelical, Brazilian evangelical, but the tendency of an evangelical church is to fragment itself. Uh, minor bishops will discover that they may have their own business and so they will open their own church and you have more and more churches. In Brazil we have more and more parties because of that. Because being a big fish in the Senate uh, implies that you have to have a court of, of uh, congressmen, deputies, etc that you have to create a clientele system. And therefore, that is very bad. No ideology, just a division of budget. So, both things walk together. The budgetary process, as you perfectly well know in America, is not a sufficient condition for having a sequence of good budgets whatever that may be. But it is abs an absolutely necessary condition to have. It's not sufficient, but it is a necessary condition. If you don't have it, you're not going to have the sequence of good budgets. Okay? So, in Brazil, our budgetary process is very bad. <coughs> Therefore, we don't even get the chance of building a term structure of interest rates. And that is the main point. Without the benchmark of a term structure of interest rates, and by that I mean the profile of indebtedness of a government, you don't have the means to pivot private savings <coughs> to private investment. And that is the main point. I will show you later. Brazil invests the same, almost the same percent of our GDP in research as the U.S. government. The Brazilian government invests 0.7% of GDP, the U.S. is 0.8%. And if you go across the borders to other countries, it's very similar. But when you look at private firms, they invest very little in Brazil. Why is that? Because we cannot leverage. 
Why can't they leverage? Because there is no real credit. And why is there no real credit? No term structure of interest rates. How can I get a mortgage, a long-term mortgage, that doesn't get a subsidy? If a bank doesn't know, if a bank doesn't have a forecast of future rates. So this is, this is one of the basic difficulties of the bank. So let me start with the situation as it is now and the opportunities. This is a big country about the same size, a little bit bigger than continental U US. If you put Alaska, it's a little bit smaller. It's bigger than Europe, okay. It has 220, 230 million inhabitants. It has a 1.8 trillion uh, dollars GDP, which is lower than we used to have three or four years ago. We achieved 2.1, 2.05. Uh, very close indeed to France, very close to the UK, but we fall back, we fell back because of this current recession. <coughs> so we have minus 7.3% of GDP growth in the last years. And if one of our main problems that was, of course, that is linked, it's both cause and consequence <coughs> of that, is that our primary surplus to GDP became a primary deficit, and our debt to GDP, starting from around 55%, <coughs> went to, is going to be 80, 81% by middle or end next year. I'm not extremely optimistic, but I'm Brazilian, and I intend to stay in Brazil, so uh, let us look at the real situation here. The primary deficit has been increasing since 2014, <coughs> as well as public debt. This year we are above 70% and we need a strong fiscal adjustment. Our budget problem is structural rather than conjunctural, meaning it's very simple. You spend about 20% of GDP with pensions. 10% are paid to 38 million people. 10% is paid to one million people. So, our nomenclatura lives well, but it costs 10% of GDP. This has to be discussed. There's no way this is not going to be discussed. This is the evolution of debt and primary surplus. Imagine what happens to our herald control of inflation if next year, by the month of May, around May, uh, the candidate, there is a candidate having 30 or 40 percent of the intentions vote, and that candidate is not very clear about which fiscal policy he is going to follow. <coughs> the ammunition for a speculative attack against the real will be there. So to be very honest, if there is a devaluation <coughs> under these circumstances, it will be like the ones they had in the past, and it will have influence over inflation. The new president that's going to come next year, this new president will start with some non-minor problems. 
first of all, it has this uh, EC, Emenda Constitucional, Constitutional Amendment, number 95, which gives rules that he is supposed to follow. Rules which may become, may create an unattainable situation. The new president will have to face huge expectations when he enters. The economy will have somehow recovered a little bit. But is that recovery sustainable? So, in October next year, this new president, which I hope will recover the authority of the executive power in Brazil. Uh, this new president will be in the situation of having to do most unpopular things. It's not easy. It's not going to be easy. Why is it not going to be easy? First of all, because of the current crisis, investment relatively to GDP has already fallen. Is it going to recover? Some recovery because of uh, asset sales by the government is possible, but this is not going well in the short term to put this back at 20%, 21%. At most, this is going to be around 18%. Clearly, that doesn't sustain growth. On the other hand, Let me show you that later. Go back. Moving. Let me go back to the little house here. On the other hand, an employment rate. which is bound to recede a little bit, will still be very high. The interest rate will have fallen in nominal terms, although we will continue to have a very high real interest rate. So the space or maneuvering of a new president will be a very small one. He has six months to use this space, recover presidential authority, or else we will go back to the situation where we are. This is a very pessimistic view, I think. But it's a realistic one. So, if we want to face problems, we have to attack the sources of fiscal disequilibrium. There are two or three. They are politically very complicated, but there is no other path. All the other paths are being exhausted. I completely, I fully disagree with fixing deficit targets, inflation uh, targets, and I fully agree with fighting deficit 
nefshet is something that's like when you go bankrupt and you have to fix a company, you start by cutting expenditures, recovering a little bit of credit. Then you go to the people that you owe money, show what you have done. And since we are bound to lose, if you lose, okay, they will give you some credit. And with better management, you will recover. Uh, the program uh, called Bridge to the Future by BNDB, which was not the sequel, but the prequel uh, of the current fiscal adjustment process, the Amenda 95, proposed the creation of a budgetary authority that wouldn't obey neither Congress, neither the President. When I was asked my opinion about that, I said, why don't you call this man or woman emperor? Okay? <laughs> Problem is not that. We have to bring public opinion into our discussions. It took us 25 years to understand that the public deficit implied inflation. I remember illustrious economists in Brazil writing papers saying that the public deficit had nothing to do with inflation. This is ridiculous, the public deficit a lot to do is a major, if not the solely cause of inflation most of the time. So, we learned that. But did we learn what causes a public deficit? I don't think so. Did we learn how the expanding procedures of a government work? Do we have any idea of how our budgetary process works in Brazil? Most of the politicians don't. We don't have an idea how revenues are estimated. We don't have an idea of how expenditures are decided. We don't even have a method for writing business plans for public policies. We call ourselves a democracy because we have a judiciary that works, because we have a series of rights, because we vote, but we forget that in a real representative democracy, the matter of deciding national strategy is one of the foundations of a democracy. And that is usually done by the interaction between the executive and the legislative power. And once a thing is agreed, you simply have to follow it. So we have to understand that as a nation, not a bunch of intellectuals, not a bunch of politicians, we have to understand that as a nation. But the budgetary process is important. And that powers have to be more balanced. On the other hand, to make things more challenging, we have to understand that we are not the US. And therefore, our budgetary process cannot copy the budgetary process in the US we have to add something extra, which is a clause for long-term macroeconomic fiscal equilibrium, like Germany does. Germany doesn't create international liquidity, or did not use to create international liquidity before the euro. So they have this thing, which for instance, they call a fundamental law. In Germany, a fundamental law is a budgetary process. 
Do you remember that Merkel was judged by the Constitutional Court of, of Germany because she provided money, she allowed uh, bonds from Greece to be bought back from German banks and she was judged by the Supreme Court of Germany because they said there was an injunction against her saying that she disobeyed the fundamental law. In America, people don't pay attention to that. That's not going to happen. You don't need to have this clause of equilibrium. Why don't you need to have, to put it very frankly, your public accounts numerically are in no better shape than ours. You have a huge public deficit. You have a term structure of interest rates that is guaranteed by a budgetary process. But you don't need to have the clause that Germany has. Why? Because you create international liquidity. And the main reason why you create international liquidity is not only the size of the economy, it's also the size of the Navy. The Navy makes that commodities be traded in dollars. I would love to have that for real, but unfortunately we don't. I would love to be capable of creating international liquidity. Printing a piece of paper, putting some income in, and giving it to someone and getting uh, a real good for it, but we can't. So we have to have a fiscal clause of equilibrium. It will take us, as a nation, to come to that point. It will take us many, many years. Why? The discussion around the budget is coming around. The need to have some equilibrium laws is coming around. Putting everything together and having all the political discussion that this implies is not simple. And people do forget. People think sometimes that when that you speak about a mandatory budget, they think it's mandatory on items. The US had an itemized budget in the 19th century. It was a complete disaster, you know? It has been forgotten here. That was a bad experience. Just wipe out, forget it, don't do it anymore. We learned that, you learned that this was no good. But in Brazil, we still have to learn that. There are mistakes, and someone sh should write a thesis about this. There are mistakes which I call unavoidable mistakes. You have to commit with a mistake in order to learn with it. So we will commit a series of unavoidable mistakes. And we will learn with them. And step by step, the situation will become clearer. Because every mistake shows a path for an improvement. The EC95 shows a series of things. It obviously, as we say in Brazil, it puts a pig in your living room. Okay? And it is a huge problem. But it's making things very clear. And what we are discussing in, really, is how does governance, governance helps leverage? How it interacts with leverage? So this is a big discussion. It's not usually put on these terms, but this is a real discussion. How do we leverage the economy? What is the discussion between the US and China? Domination of the South China Sea. So many water, in, so much water in the world. Though. Why do you need that part of the world? It's very simple. The oil lanes to Japan and Korea. If China controls that, controls the access to energy, then those two countries and Taiwan too will have to converge to China economically, politically. 
and that will create a block, extremely strong block, which is not on the best American interest. So, and it will also take Sayaraj from the U.S. That region alone has seven trillion dollars for in China. So, it's, there is a question of leverage there. Governance, geopolitical interests, all of this interacts. For Brazil, in the next 10 years, we will be discussing governance and trying to fix a better path. We will proceed step by step and committing lots of mistakes. We will proceed in a fiscal adjustment, trying to find our better path. Meanwhile, well, meanwhile, we have a strength of our agriculture, we have a strength of our natural resources, of a population that has matured, which has a better level of education. Let me try to see if I can show you that. Not the ideal level of education, but should I click here? Okay. <coughs> Lots of information. <laughs> you probably know all that, but uh, two hundred and eight million people in two thousand seventeen. <coughs> Cultural diversity and internal immigration. We should open more for immigration. This is a tricky point because uh, most people in Brazil don't think that we should open for immigration, but we should open selectively to immigration. It's absolutely necessary. We are a kind of social democracy, but incomplete. Urbanization has reached 85% level, which on one side is a problem, on the other side is a huge opportunity to improve the level of education, to improve the efficiency of the economic functioning. Most of everything in Brazil is concentrated around Sao Paulo, Rio, and Minas Gerais, the three states of the South uh, west region, southeast region. In the south and in the northeast, you complete the rest. And the centers, uh, center and north regions of Brazil are not a void. They clearly are not a void anymore. Population is redistributing, and it will become more and more important. And the cradle for our democratic revolution is probably going to come from there. Why? Because the structure of the states are much thinner in there than in the rest of the country. So, if you go to Goiás, a percentage of money that's spent by the state relatively to the GDP is much smaller than Minas or Rio or even Sao Paulo. So these states bring in a new mentality. of the 80s. 
we are paying a toll for bad governments in the past. This is not only an evolution, it's not only the pill, birth control, etc. It's more than that. Many Brazilians immigrated between 1980 and 1988. So we are paying a toll. We are probably paying a toll right now. We are losing people on there, 25, 30. Mostly to the US and to, to Europe, Northern Europe. And our population is likely to evolve like this. We could easily absorb a million people more every year, and this would boost our growth by 1% yearly without much investment. Of course, we don't, I'm not speaking about opening to. Uh, any region of the world, we have to be a bit, a bit selfish and we should have policies similar to Canada or Australia or even the US in the past. And we should open to people that have, I'm not speaking about PhDs, but that have a better education. We really <coughs> could do with more Spaniards that know how to make tapas, okay? There is a guy in Sao Paulo that came to Brazil 12 years old, when he was 12 years old, and he has around $400 million nowadays. He's 80-something. He worked all his life. And he has a series of restaurants. He employs around 2,000 people. It's not bad. A good guy to import. Okay? So, not bad at all. We should open. There is a limit. Million people a year, 20 million in 20 years. We could easily absorb that. We absorbed relatively to our population. We absorbed more than that at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 30s. We actually only closed for immigration after the Second World War when we were convinced under the doctrine of national security uh, proposed by the U.S. that there was a big danger that we should be, that we could be flooded by Eastern communists uh, coming to Brazil. So we closed our borders <coughs> and we simply remained closed. And all our unions, unions don't like more people coming into the market. It reduces their bargaining power. So they agree with this idea, let us remain closed. We should open more. If you open the financial market, if you open for investment, you should open for people. Put some rules and let people come. So, to synthesize, I expect two or three difficult years ahead. <coughs> Not as difficult as the past four years, but still difficult because we have to continue this initial fixing of our public accounts. On the <coughs> good side, we are at the low, still at the very low, of commodity prices. And somehow I expect within a year or so for commodity prices to raise a little bit. Uh, the iron ore around 60, 70, it's okay, it's good. Uh, food. The demand for food is increasing. The Chinese, all the Asians are eating more. They are not going to be slim for long, but uh, <laughs> that's good business for us. 
uh, our industry, if we devalue a little bit, our industry will brief, don't forget that the size of our industry is almost the same as the size of the industry of France, although it's very much controlled by Europeans. And there's going to be a lot of Chinese investment, a lot of European investment. The Chinese are simple to explain. They are going to invest everywhere. Uh, that's their way to curtail the United Nations, uh, NATO, whatever is Western. But not only that, when you have four trillion dollars in your hands, it's not the person that owes you the money that has a problem. You have a problem. If ever they have a harsher situation, not a war, but a harsher situation, than the US, they will have a problem. So they want to buy assets everywhere, and they are going to invest everywhere doing this. Brazil this year is having foreign direct investment of $84 billion around that. It clearly covers our current account deficit, and the current account deficit has been reduced because we actually have a trade surplus. Not a good quality one, but we do have a big trade surplus. We made an adjustment of $110 billion on our trade surplus from minus 60 to plus 50 in about a year or so. That's a fantastic adjustment. But there are many issues around. So, do we expect Brazil to grow? Yes, I expect Brazil to grow, to recover growth. Uh, do we expect Brazil to have tremendous investment opportunities? Yes, especially in sales of public assets. Uh, do I expect to Brazil to sustain all this in the long term? Not the sales of public assets, of course, but if we start moving towards a better quality fiscal adjustment, then yes, I expect in the next 10 years for adjustments to be made. One has to be very careful, and this is my final word, one has to be very careful with one thing. Uh, Brazilians are a little bit uh, Americans are between Germans and Brazilians in a certain sense, and closer to in mentality, and closer to Germans than to Brazilians. Uh, but Brazilians have this tendency of having cycles of <coughs> optimist trophism and pessimist trophism. Don't be confounded by those. If you are there in the long, for the long term, you will make good business you can make good money, and if you do, as I did, visit the interior of the country, you will see tremendous opportunities that are not being explored correctly. Let me give you just a simple case, very factual uh, and easy to see. About uh, 20 years ago, I went to uh, Hondonia, and I visited their recently inaugurated shopping center. The shabbiest thing that I have ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, when I was asked what I did find about that building, I said, it's marvelous, it's fantastic. Not even in New, in New York, you don't see anything like that. <laughs> I was not lying. Uh, and they were so happy. Then I came back uh, about 10 years ago. I went back to Bologna 10 years ago, and we were building a new one, model, with shops from Sao Paulo. Okay, very nice. And I have heard that they are destroying the first one, 
to make a parking lot of a new one. <coughs> so there is an evolution. And clearly, distribution of goods is a tremendous opportunity in Brazil. Logistics, integration, uh, production, etc. Our agriculture has produces 230 million tons uh, cereal <coughs> equipment per year. The U.S. is around 600. But we are growing, the production is growing very, very, very fast. And there is demand for both the U.S. Uh, and us. So not only do we help world peace, food is very important. Believe me. When people have their bellies fed, they don't want to fight, they don't make quarrel, but they keep to certain limits. And this is going to, this is producing a lot of money in that region. After, when you own a farm there, and I was told this, this by a very wealthy man, and you have bought four or five apartments in Sao Paulo, one in Rio, uh, another one in New York, etc. You don't have, you don't want to buy any more apartments or buildings uh, in big cities. And you start thinking about building some kind of factory close to where you stay most of the year. And then they start investing in industry, in businesses different from agriculture. It's a phenomenon well known anywhere in, uh, in the world, the US. Uh, the state of Sao Paulo and Brazil, etc. So, we will continue to grow, but are we going to grow at the necessary speed? That is a big question. What is the necessary speed? Does that thing exist? Does it make sense? Uh, <coughs> I, my contingency is this is a government's problem. It's not only economical. And we have to fix our governments. It's going to take time. Uh, it's going to be impacted by a series of other things. And, but <coughs> except for a major world war, Brazil is pretty much isolated from many world's problems. It is an advantage coming from our disadvantage. Not being so much integrated, being a very much closed economy, still, uh, still a very much closed economy, we are pretty much protected from our fluctuations. So we have some time to fix things. We don't have eternity. We have some time. So thank you very much. And I don't know what is the habit here, but uh, should I ask questions? Should I say goodbye? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Open to questions, please. Uh, uh, it's uh, a question about, uh, I'm sorry, the, the United States in the sense that you compare uh, U.S.'s fiscal accounts to those of Brazil, saying not their difference, and maybe the difference is uh, the Navy and, uh, and liquidity. And I'm curious uh, if the United States continues along the route that it is, at what point does, do we have budgetary problems the same way that Brazil has budgetary problems? Two things. If I knew that, I would be richer <laughs> than Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, and uh, whomever you want to put together, if I knew the exact date. The U.S. obviously has tremendous assets, and it has shown in the past a capacity to fix itself. But, and one should never speak about someone else's country, especially when he is in that country. <laughs> uh, 
but let me tell you the following. Uh, you have in this country a discussion that is very similar to the one that Athens did 2,300 years ago, 2,500 years ago. Uh, I usually use Athens as an example in lectures to my students. I have bought this tetradrach that is 2,500 years, and I show it to them and say, this was part of the Parthenon's treasure. Treasure. The Parthenon was actually the safe box of Athens. It had a huge statue of Pallas Athenea, their goddess, covered with gold. That was a technical reserve. The rest was silver. Where did that money come from? That money come from the, the League of Delos. They basically took the money from all the Greek states and piled it there. And they used it to, for several purposes. One of the purposes was to finance their fleet. And their fleet implied their power over the other Greek nations, over Arctica. Okay? But every year they would have their Medicare, Medicaid discussion at the Ag at the parliament. Remember it was direct democracy. Everyone, ten thousand people would vote with oyster shells. And every year you had to deal with the problem that at the height of its richness, Athens had built those walls. Those walls were public works. And people got accustomed to the money that they got from those public works. So every year, they had to choose between social spending, their Medicare, Medicaid, and the maintenance of a fleet. Guess what? Who lost every year? The fleet would always go one year more without maintenance. It's quite <coughs> obvious. One year without maintenance, it's okay. At a certain point, 20 years had passed, the fleet was quite weak. <coughs> but they needed the fleet to control the Persians. They needed the fleet to control the Greeks. And someone came with this crazy idea. Well, since we don't have a political clue to make the adjustment at home, let us try to make a capital gain. Let us attack someone, we we'll get the money from the someone, and things will be fixed. Of course, the persons were too strong, yet yeah, too strong. Uh, their allies was good attacking them, they had already grabbed all the money from their, uh, their allies. Sparta was there, but Sparta was inland and had a very strong army. So they decided, and the Phoenicians of course were allies to the Sparta. So they decided to attack another Greek city that was not in their empire. In Syracuse in Italy. They attacked it twice. They failed twice. Half of the fleet was destroyed. The fleet became non-operation. The League of Delos rebelled. Attica rebelled. And Sparta, of course, acted and attacked Athens, forcing Athens to surrender. And then they had to demolish the walls. And for a century more, Athens was a terrace of the old world, of culture. That is a century of Isocrates. So clearly, there are choices to be made, always. And it seems that sometimes uh, people forget that uh, nothing is for granted. So, at the end of World War II, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was really the best strategist of the 20th century. 
maybe to get him to stop it, but uh, <laughs> that's a bad guy. He was a very, very good strategist. The U.S. participated in the war, but because it was far away, it helped with the power of its economy. It lost about 600,000 people, most of them not in combat. About half of them died in accidents during the war, related to the war, but not in combat. Uh, major loss of lives were in Normandy, Okinawa. If you compare to Germany, Germany lost eight and a half million people. Poland, uh, Russia lost 20 million people. And at the end of the war, the British fleet was done. In 56, British and French decided to take their chances and see if they were still world powers. And they took Swiss. The U.S. and the Soviet Union together told them to leave to abandon Swiss. Just after that, the British, being very practical, recognized that they had nothing to do anymore in the Persian Gulf. This was 56. And from that time onwards, oil stopped being traded in pounds. Not many people remember that. Oil being traded in pounds means that you have a tremendous value. A practical point of view, you give a piece of paper with link to someone and he gives you energy. A real currency should be energy. It is not. As long as the U.S. has that, it will maintain a very leveraged the effects of unleveraging may be extremely disastrous. If you compare on the last six years the amount of seigneurage of a dollar with the amount spent with the American military, the bill almost closes. And this is good. From a Brazilian point of view, I may say it created a huge externality. No wars, less wars, less deaths, more trade, open seas. That was a result of these 70 years. But we should not take for granted that if you don't have a public finances, if you start cutting things, that uh, things may not change. You see, even supposedly allied countries may change their positions. Uh, having to concentrate in the South China Sea, the U.S. is reducing its presence in Europe. The Eighth Army is not in Germany anymore. People don't say because there is NATO, etc. But the Eighth Army was in Germany. You didn't have a German army in the U.S. Uh, the Eighth Army in Germany. After the Eighth Jump, uh, Army uh, receded from Germany, uh, Germany started changing its position towards Russia, more appeasing. They even expelled the boss of CIA in Berlin. Do you think that the Germans are so dumb as to not know that the Americans have spied on them for at least 80 years. No one is so dumb. But there is a change of position. And these micro changes are, are something that you have to deal with, that you have to understand. And I, from a Brazilian perspective, I prefer naval lanes controlled by the U.S. than naval lanes controlled by China. 
Uh, I see difficult changes ahead in Europe. Basically, they would have to lower the welfare state in order to keep it. It's a dynamic process. And the same thing is true here. What is behind all this? Absolute necessity to keep ahead in innovation. And innovation depends on investment. Investment in innovation. And it's a question of relative with Asia has increased, so we have to increase more. But in order to have money to invest, firms need the money to be left with them. If you have pensions, subsidies, uh, huge indebtedness, high interest rate, etc., you have to have huge taxation or your currency will become a very weak one, no matter what. So there are choices there to be made. And these choices are coming to the US, to Europe, to Brazil, uh, with different characteristics. One, one that you see is countries, or democratic ones, where more right wing, right populist wing, uh, more fascist uh, things are raising, becoming more popular. This is a long term thing. And it's linked to the rise, uh, the rise of uh, Asia, the rise of standard, uh, 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 raising of standard of living in Asia. It's displaced. If you have two things in the world, national resources, uh, innovation, and you have to ignore the rest. Credit is important, but it has been reduced after 2008. Uh, if you look at those two things, the increase of innovation, of the innovation supply, will have an effect on all the developed nations. It's becoming more competitive. Professor Simon Tindel, thank you for your wonderful lecture. It was a, a show of uh, economy, geography, and I'll go straight to the point. We all know that uh, our Brazilian economy is founded on commodities. You spoke about agriculture, you spoke about the interior of Brazil. You are a patriot and an enthusiast of our country, as I am myself. So the question, all right, is about uh, uh, investment in commodities, especially in uh, mining. After the Ike Batista episode and the accident uh, of, uh, of Mariana. So I would like you to speak a little about mine and also about the, the new stage of privatization of oil and gas in Brazil. Thank you very much. Let me start with the latter part, oil and gas. Brazil lacks uh, pipeline network for gas. It would be very important. We started clumsy in that direction to, to create such a thing. When we privatized, we sold to Brookfield a pipeline of Petrobras. I think that given the proper fiscal investment and clearing the path against every ambient uh, environmentalist uh, because 
we all know that there are fair and environmental demands, but there are those that are not so fair. Just preparing uh, the way, clearing the way for that would do much. And if we do that, we have huge gas resources, both at sea and in the interior. Montesquieu, as Minas Gerais, is a good example. There is a huge amount in Amazonas, and that is cheap energy. Not only energy, that's a chemical input for many industries, and it would be very useful. But we have to have the pipelines. <coughs> we have to have the deposits. That is going to create a huge business, as it is in the US. It will take 10 years on the make, it's natural. It's 10, 20 years, it's an engineering problem. But if you take energy, not only to the southeast, but to the northeast, where labor is cheaper, where you have many universities now, the results will be above expectations, I think. That is regarding to gas. Regarding to oil, we are seeing a period where oil is at its lows. Companies like Anadarko, Apache, and others are not doing well. Even Schlumberger, which is not an oil producer, producer, but someone that produces uh, things, products that are going to be used by uh, the oil industry is not doing well. And it's exactly because Schlumberger is not doing well and because the world is growing this year at around three and a half percent that we are bound to have an oil price explosion within two or three years. So, Brazil has huge reserves. Petrobras is not only fixing itself internally, but it's selling many assets, and production is growing. So, Petrobras produces now the equivalent to 2.7 million barrels a day. It's not only oil, it's gas, oil, etc but it's equivalent to 2.7 million barrels, and it's exporting 600,000 barrels a day. Let me be very conservative, unlike the people at Petrobras. Let us say that within three years, we will be producing three and a half million barrels. Our economy won't grow so fast, and we will be exporting around a million barrels, 800,000 barrels a day. If ever prices go up to $80, I'm not making a prediction, just looking at similar situations, $30 more, over 800,000 barrels a day, that means $24 million a day, that here means increase in trade surplus of around $8 billion a year. That's a lot of money you can leverage a lot on that. If it goes to 100, it's much higher than that. It will all depend on one thing. Uh, how fast it happens, how fast it doesn't happen. It depends on the development of shale gas in the U.S. up to a certain point. Imagine that Trump was a devious businessman, ah. which is not <laughs> okay. Imagine that Trump was a devious businessman and that he would like to hump uh, Chinese growth, uh, European growth, because he is envious. 
of other parts of the region uh, of the world growing at 6% or at 25 when the US will be growing at about 2, 2 and a half. What may he do? He may say the following. I'm going to put a tax on energy exports. He's not going to forbid energy exports. He's going to tax them. This will actually make the Brent and the WTI have different prices. Oil in America and oil abroad in London. The British market and the American market will have different prices. That's why perhaps ExxonMobil, Chevron, they are focusing on the Brent. Uh, if that happens, if that happens, uh, for Brazil will be extremely advantageous. And uh, investment there will, will come, inevitably. Today, it's coming as a means of supply, especially for the Chinese and for the Pau of France. Uh, and even for the British, they are trying to diversify. The Shell bought British gas. The main reason was Brazilian fields, mm. uh, Brazilian oil fields, mm. which account for at least 50% of the British gas value. But uh, the future may be even worse if to grow if the low investment continues for a year. But that's a cycle, that is a story of oil industry. You overinvest, prices go down, uh, then you don't invest, prices go up. It's long term it's uh, it's how it works. In terms of minerals you see that uh, Valle do Rio Doce is lowering um, its debt to a bit on the 26th, next 26th, within uh, 14 days, uh, 15 days, Valle do Rio Doce will produce the results of its third quarter. On their last presentation here in the US, uh, they have shown the decline of their debt to a bit ratio. And they have put 219, uh, they put a, a reducing number for uh, 2018. And for 2019, they have put a zero with a question mark. Of course, it's not sensible to have zero debt. Zero debt for a company like Valuable Hilton is not reasonable. Either they will invest in something else, like maybe buy back their stock, they may pay more dividends, they may buy another company. Is that company going to be in, uh, in uh, iron ore, or in metals, or uh, paper, perhaps? Why did they hire a new president that comes from the paper industry? Okay, so many questions may be raised. Paper is another industry where Brazil may grow a lot. Uh, then you have the food industry. During all these crises, food demand did not proceed. And I think that's going to grow. It's my personal opinion. People in Asia are getting accustomed to eating more. Uh, perhaps it's good for business, bad for health. If you, if you look, if you take care and uh, look at the films on the day, Victory Day in New York, 1945. Take care to look at the people in the streets. They were slim, <laughs> okay? If you look today, they are less slim, let me put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to happen with China. People are happier when they eat more. We just have to change our our beauty standards, okay? <laughs> it's a, uh, they, they are happier when they eat more, and we are going to produce more food. 
with a change of climate in Brazil. Uh, and the climate is changing. We are at the middle of October. I remember 30 years ago here in New York, I would be dressing, using, wearing a weather coat, a uh, normal coat, very heavy one. And now I was sweating coming to here. Uh, the weather change, uh, according to the people at Edinburgh, the, the new thing that they are producing, we will possibly have three harvests a year instead of two. More carbon, more water, more heat, more food production, more people eating, more money coming. So what we have to fix is the public sector. Uh, it's not the private one. The private one will do. And we have to create incentives for developing our own industries. Which doesn't mean that we have to have a car industry of our own. It's not that. But maybe we could enter, uh, start aggregating more value to, to, to food production. Brazilians did buy Tropicana after all, okay? That was a good move. But why don't we have more brands? Uh, why don't we buy more brands? Uh, this is integration. This is, we have to evolve on, on a series of issues. Thank you. Thank you. I think that Professor Fischlow. First of all, Professor Simonson, thank you for an outstanding lecture and uh, sharing these wonderful insights. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit about the future of governance in Brazil, starting with the political center uh, with the governance scenarios after the election of 2018. I just share it. Not even the talk comes that but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he talks to God every day. Uh, he's asking the same question. Look, in Brazil, there are many people that tend to look at the discussion, I think, from a very simplistic point of view. Take the dollar bill. What do you see in the bank? Masonic eye. Okay? You do not have a cross in that bill. Do you have a cross? No. Down of Rio Grande, as you say in America, uh, down of Rio Grande, there has been an ongoing discussion that has lasts now 250 years perhaps. And that is quite hateful. It's a Jesuitical Masonic discussion that has its origins in France. The Johnsonist Jesuitic discussion on the nature of state. It is a discussion about the nature of state. You have to remember that in America you have drunk from Masons that you know, were influenced by Hume. In Brazil, we drank from Masons that inf were influenced by Rousseau, by Montaigne, by Voltaire. Rousseau was quite leftist, okay? <coughs> so, different origins, different sociological histories, backgrounds, and you probably know that New York, before being New York, when it was called New Amsterdam, received a bunch of Jews. Where from? Brazil. Okay. And Brazil, when you see the paintings of Brazilian discovery, you see that boat, uh, uh, Caravel, uh, Caravel, with a cross. And it says, that cross is a Templar's cross. It's a cross of the order of Christ. And the siege of the order of Christ was 
the comfort, the monastery of Tamar. If you go to Tamar, you see a castle on the top. You go down to the village and you will find a synagogue. The cartographers were right there. The association of the Templars with the Jews, the cartographers, the knowledge to build the boats, and later on the organization of the finances. What is the Portuguese go around around Africa but the creation of a sustainable cash flow for navigations? So Brazil actually starts or the ideas making to Brazil may be traced back to the day that Jacques de Molay was burned in France. The order of the Templars was divided and later, some years later, many years later, John of Gaunt married his daughter Isabel of Lancaster to King John II of Portugal. And he was the father of uh, uh, Infante do Henrique, the navigator, Henry the navigator, who had read the book by Chaucer for instance, called the Astrolab. This guy started building the cash flow, and he motivated the initial colonization of Brazil. But those are our roots. The ancient synagogue, the oldest synagogue in America is in Recife, not in the US, in Recife. Very interesting to visit. And it's linked to that synagogue in Toronto. So, when Vasco da Gama circumnavigated Africa, and if you read the Lusiades, and you arrive uh, at that point where he arrived in Ethiopia, and by miracle, he finds an Iberian Jew in, in Ethiopia. <coughs> the year is 1492. That knew how to navigate from there to India. It's written in the Lusiades. So, all by accident. This is your origin of Brazil. <coughs> and we have started building a country, and there have been huge divisions. Control inside, control outside. This was the initial discussion. And this has, discussion has evolved for 200 years. It's the same thing in Colombia, it's the same thing in Peru, it's the same thing in Mexico, with different characters, with different situations, but it's the same discussion. It's a discussion on the nature of a state. So we have to evolve beyond that. And it is difficult to evolve beyond that. The PT was born when? Inside uh, a school named Sion, Zion, a Catholic school. So you see, all the roots are there. Most, some of the members of the PMDB top staff, top politicians, are said to be Masons. So, if you look at the discussion, the discussion is there. It's subtle. It's not clear even for them. But it's a discussion on how do you organize the state. We have to go beyond <coughs> this discussion. We have to put forward uh, some things that are, may not be so natural for our culture in the short run. <coughs> so, like, why do you, should you do the right things? Because they are right. <laughs> Quite obvious. But this is Kant. Okay? Like, I don't know how you say it in English. Categoric imperative. Okay? The categoric imperative is not part of the Brazilian culture. So <laughs> I think that we will come to that slowly. 
we are coming to that slowly. The judiciary is having a very important role in there, not because the judiciary believes in God. Most of our judges haven't ever read or heard about God. They have heard, but they haven't read God. It's not part of our, our culture, as most Americans don't read God. But uh, it's because the problems are there. People are saying, well, there are some issues like reputation, predictability. Uh, these are important after all. So this is coming, but it is slow. It's a build up of a culture. As I said, 25 years to understand that the public deficit influenced inflation. Now we have to understand that uh, uh, letting your exchange rate overvalued will lower inflation, but that's not stable. Okay? Uh, there are many issues. It, it's a learning process. It's a learning pro process. My assumption is that if you don't bring public opinion into the discussion, if it's solely a discussion <coughs> of the elite, we will go nowhere. If we have a vote, <coughs> then we have to have public opinion becoming aware of these issues. And this is going to happen slowly. Listen, it's slow here for many issues too. After all, the journalists, they are part of a population. The people that have to explain ideas to others, they are part of a population. If you ask any professor in the U.S., an economics professor, how many times he had predicted something that was quite obvious and no one listened to him. And sometimes it's bunches of people saying, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. No one pays attention. This is part of the foundation of the theory of unavoidable mistakes. <laughs> you, you have to commit to suffer and then if you are smart enough you will learn uh, it will be slow it will be slow it will take time but I'm confident that it will happen there are cultural issues that we have to deal with Unfortunately, some of our thinkers sometimes have captivating ideas uh, that convince us of things that are not so helpful. Gilberto Freire, a great Brazilian socialist, convinced everyone that in Brazil uh, sexuality was an important thing. Because of our historical origins. So the motivation is a Portuguese word I don't remember, but translation, a la Syria, was an important thing. Uh, this is not true. But from my life experience, this is a problem everywhere. Okay? So. We have, uh, I think we're going to finish up with one last question, and we cannot finish without uh, Professor Fischler, please. Well, after your presentation extending from ancient Greece to <laughs> projections of what is going to happen to the price of oil, uh, let me uh, turn to a simple question. And the simple question is simply, how does a country in the modern world grow with an investment rate that is so slow that it becomes impossible to deal with the infrastructure, with the necessity to avoid getting into balance of payments problems again, 
when imports begin entering Brazil, as they will very shortly, and uh, the only way out of this is for the government to run a surplus. And why is there such a reluctance for people to focus on what the real issue in terms of Brazilian growth is? As I said, <laughs> what is the nominal deficit of Brazil? <coughs> Uh, we were having, uh, last year, we were around 10% nominal deficit. And we were spending 14%, we were having a 14, 13% interest rate over a debt that was uh, equivalent to 60% of GDP. That means that the debt was, was costing around six and a half, seven percent a year. More than that, that's 60 percent of 13, uh, seven and a half. With, uh, and I also mentioned, 10 percent pensions for 39 million people, 10 percent pensions for one million people. But these one million people are very powerful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> What is the issue there? Reducing the interest rate, and we may discuss the interest rate later, and on the coffee cup. Uh, I think that it was exaggerated. What it basically did was save Brazil from having a banking crisis. But uh, now we have, let us say, 75% Debt to GDP with an interest rate that's going to be around 7% next year. 7, 7, 8%, let's say. So 75% plus 8, 6%. So we did all this to reduce 1, 1, 1.5%. 1.5% uh, would be the reduction of uh, our nominal deficit because of a reduction of the interest rate, and we don't know if ever there is a devaluation next year, a maxi devaluation because of politics, if we will have to raise the interest rate. So let us say, where are else are we going to cut? We have cut all investment. So the discussion will be around pensions. This is an avoidable. What are the two ways? But any cuts of pensions will only take place in the future rather than now. Unless we become more Portuguese. Imagine, uh, this is a question of authority. Uh, in Brazil, and lawyers and judges, uh, they don't agree with me, but if they think twice, they will have to. We have an Article Zero in our Constitution. It's printed in invisible ink, but it's there. The article says the following. His Excellency, the President of the Republic, illustrious successor to His Majesty Peter II, has every power to solve any emergency. He declares what is an emergency or not. That is real power. That's what Trump wants. <laughs> <laughs> that is real power. It has been used intensively and extensively. Uh, of course, the presidents don't like to read the single capitalist of this Article Zero, which is also printed in Invisible Info, but in very small letters, and says, if he doesn't fix it, we kick him out. It, we did it six times since 1950. Uh, imagine if you 
have a president that is elected in the five or ten million more votes than the second round. Will he have authority? Imagine that in the day he is elected, he says that it's no, not going to be a re-election for me, for neither for any of my successes, that I'm cutting president's pensions forever, and that I'm not going to receive a wage until the fiscal situation is fixed, and that I'm going to cut the expenditures of a presidency by 50%. You can do that. There's a lot of fat there. Imagine that he does all that. The next day, he has 90% of support, and 95. And then he will focus upon the judiciary and the legislative. It's inevitable. I'm not for it. I'm just saying. But if you get a guy with authority, he has six months to use his authority and his authority has to be used to focus on expenditures. So what is going to happen? I don't know, but it will be a fierce fight. And this is not going to be, if it is to succeed, this is not going to be something that our grandchildren will be happy that it was done 30 years ago. Portugal cut wages, pensions by 30%. Do you recall that? And the socialists, and of course they lost at the next election, they lost that position. Okay, but they did it. The socialists, when they came, they restored bits of it. Of course, you may argue, well, the elite in Portugal has other sources of income. Why? because many of them are employed in Brussels. That's a German system for controlling Europe. Pay them a wage in Brussels, okay? But it worked, and somehow they fixed the accounts and Portugal is growing at 3%, okay? <clears throat> so there are choices there. How much will we choose? It's either that or having inflation. You agree with me? Not necessarily having inflation. I think the answer is in the exchange rate, which has been held steady now for a long time. Uh, and the real rate, uh, of course, has become less interesting and the internal market now is more interesting than the external market. Uh, but uh, the, the point is, all of these things are related. And it's precisely the inability of this relationship to be understood. But what I say is, coming to the election in October, we'll have a new president. If he is elected with 10,000 votes more than the second one, it will be a different situation. But if he is elected with millions of votes more, he has one chance to increase his authority and make something with it. I bet that the person will do it, whoever he is. If he is going to do all the right things, it's not natural that anyone does all the right things, okay? <laughs> but if he uh, does some of the right things, one of them will be to fix <coughs> the fiscal side a little bit faster. We cannot wait for that. Why can't we wait forever? Because the world is growing. If the world wasn't growing, then we would be okay. Have you noticed, I, I see there are many Brazilians here and uh, many Americans that do understand a bit of Portuguese. Have you noticed how many Brazilians are there in New York today? 
You go in the streets and you look at that guy and say, he's speaking Portuguese. <laughs> Why? Because the exchange rate obviously is helping. We never, we have a current, uh, we have a trade surplus. Of course, of course, have been oppressed. It's not the good trade surplus, it's a bad one. <laughs> bad quality, but we compressed imports. But we have a current account deficit. Of course, there are interest, revenue, uh, the, uh, dividends, uh, interest, but the amount of money that is being spent with, uh, with travel, why is that so? Because possibly the exchange rate should be 380 or 4 instead of 320. From my past experience, that things always come back to you in a very disagreeable way. And it's going to, to happen. Okay, well, actually when the exchange rate was two to one, you should have seen the portrait of Brazilians. <laughs> <laughs> but that, uh, I do appreciate very much all of your comments. I, I for one, uh, in the question about the U.S., I think put in perspective, I, I was always grappling with it, and you've done an excellent job of, of specifying and thinking about it, and I appreciate it very much. I think that whole uh, presentation and your comments have been for me, uh, and so I think the whole audience have been doing the Thank you very much.